I already had spent time in Chicago documenting intentional communities, and so I reached out to Alpha Farm, and uh, what was a two-week visit turned into a two-year residency, and uh, here I still am. So the first few photos here are from Alpha Farm during my residency between 2009 and 2011. Bill Serino, is this your mailbox? This, this is your mailbox in this picture, isn't it? Yeah. And then the next few photos are from uh, Living Well Nature Spirit Sanctuary. I lived there for about nine months after Alpha Farm and got to document a lot of the various events that Mark and Mary Gold held there over the years, including fire walks and uh, various events. And this was Mary Lou Gertzen was at an event they had called uh, Blessing in the Spring, and she was telling stories and then led some song circles at that event. And this was from one of the events before the fire walk. Heather Hutton is there on the organ, came up from Southern Oregon. And then this is Madonna, who was a longtime Deadwood resident. I had the privilege to do a portrait session with her uh, after she turned 100 years old. Thank you to Jesse and Elaine Pattison and Neela for helping make that happen. Couple other longtime Deadwood residents we miss, Paul Harry, Mary Lou Gertson. Paul was very proud of those sunflowers. That's why like, he actually picked me up from the farmer's market that day and he's like, you have to come over and you have to photograph my sunflowers. And Rock Creek, gotten to spend a lot of time at Rock Creek with all the beautiful people there. This was, this was a, you know, I had said to Johnny, I'm so curious about the process of shearing sheep. What is that like? And he was like, well, it's kind of like giving a haircut, but with much bigger clippers. And I was like, okay. So I got to help and mo mostly witness, but help a little bit when uh, Johnny and Shiloh and Brian uh, did around the sheep shearing. And then this is Shiloh with our friend uh, Paul from Kenya, who was out visiting. And when Shiloh had been visiting him in Kenya, they processed a goat together there in Kenya. And when Paul came to Deadwood, he, they did the whole ritual over again in Deadwood. And once again, it was an honor to be a part of that. And this is from a walk I did with Johnny up uh, Rock Creek Canyon, I think in 2018. So this audience knows pretty well that Deadwood has quite the history. You know, this, there, and there's been a, you know, all those places I just talked about are part of this counterculture migration to this area that happened in the late 60s and 70s. And when these counterculturists joined the residents who were already living here, who many of them were pioneer families, you know, third, fourth generation from pioneer families, logging families. And then there was this influx of counterculturists from California and the East Coast and all over the place. And uh, the mixture of people we have here um, really makes this a unique community. And I'm sure many of you have heard about we're starting this Deadwood Oral History and Archives project. So the project grew out of people wanting to know more about Deadwood's history and the realization that as older residents passed away, we were losing vital parts of the community's collective memory and a valuable resource for people interested in rural life and the counterculture. Um, Jerry Joffe and I are beginning interviews for this project, and um, we were able to do this work, you know, I mean, DCS has sponsored this whole project and endeavor, and then we've been able to, we're able to do this work because of um, our donors from the Western Lane Community Foundation, from the Sayusla Institute, and generation or in donations from individual community members. We also have great advisors helping us with this project, including Terry Baxter, who's on the Oregon Country Fair Archive and also uh, works for Multnomah County Archives and the Lane County History Museum also uh, is thrilled to be working with us and they are happy to um, host copies of our interviews once we have those copies. We'll be having those available um, on the DCS website, so we'll be storing them digitally, but then we'll also be storing them at Lane County History Museum. And I'm just gonna backtrack a bit here. Um, so kind of what we have right now is, 
you know, we started with the history of Deadwood Creek Services and the community center because as new people came to the community, a lot of people wanted to know the history of the center. And, you know, even some, and we even had a couple of new members on the board who hadn't lived here very long. And they're like, well, I want to know the history of the center more. And so that was the motivation for starting this project is just learning more about our history and so we can share that with future generations so right now for the deadwood community center specifically we have a handful of photos some which are in our current archives some that people like bill sereno have in their private collections and uh, we also have about three boxes of historical documents that we've gathered up to this point. And we suspect that there are other um, documents out there, other photos out there. So we're excited to see what people have. Um, so right now we don't necessarily have a long-term storage solution for this archivable material, um, but we're working on it. And in the meantime, we're kind of putting it out to the community to see what do people have. Um, so if anyone has photos, videos, writings, historical documents, clippings, um, definitely let us know. And as we work to find a place to store all this stuff long term, we would be happy to uh, include items from people's collections. So Jerry Joffe, who I'm working with on this Deadwood Oral History and Archives project, uh, also had recently joined the Counterculture History Coalition. And when we first started working together, Jerry was like, Kate, you have to, you have to get involved with this coalition. It's great people doing great work. Um, so I did in, I guess, February, March of uh, this past year, got involved with the coalition. And uh, this is a group of artists and academics and archivists from, you know, mostly from the Bay Area to Eugene who are, you know, working with um, various counterculture collections. And, you know, the, the goal of this is to kind of create this corridor from Eugene to San Francisco where we have various members with their own personal archives. Our longer term goal is to have various traveling exhibits so that we could share some of the um, archives our members have with the public. This is a picture of the back to the land section of the counterculture museum archives in uh, Willits, California, which Paulo and I got to visit this past uh, summer. We also got to visit Greenfield Ranch. Uh, Chia Rodriguez is a member of the coalition and she is a second generation back to the lander. And she's also um, a successful professional legal uh, marijuana grower who has her own brand and business and is doing really amazing things, especially surrounding uh, women in the cannabis industry. And uh, Chia kindly hosted Paulo and I, and we got to tour Greenfield Ranch and interview numerous elders at the ranch. Um, this is actually a map of the ranch and to get a sense and scale of the size of Greenfield, it's probably about the size of Deadwood. It's huge and, um, you know, someone had bought this land back in the 70s thinking they could subdivide it and then realized the laws weren't friendly to that. And so what they ended up doing is making parcels and having groups of people go in together on the parcels so it could be legal. And um, I forget the exact size, but it's, it's, I remember when she told me the acreage, it was like, wow, your community is like the size of Deadwood. It's a... Uh, this is uh, outside of Ukiah, California, and you know, it, it, similarly to Deadwood, a lot of the people ended up at Greenfield in the late 60s and 70s, and so now um, it's second and third generation, and, and, and like Deadwood, some of them have gone off to other places, but some of them have stayed, or some of them have gone away to school and come back to, you know, live on the land like their parents did. So if you want to learn more about the coalition, we do have some trifold brochures here. Feel free to take those. And um, this is an exhibit, one of our um, members, the Humboldt Area People's Archive. They facilitated uh, a booth and display at the, um, at the big cannabis event down in uh, Northern California this past summer. And uh, these two banners you're seeing here, those are uh, put together by Richard from the... Uh, Counterculture Museum archives. So one of the members of the coalition is the Back to the Land Project, and we have Paulo Stupia and Brian Hill here from the Back to the Land Project. We also have Jerry Joffe here from the Counterculture History Coalition, 
And um, I'm going to pass the mic off to the Back to the Land project. Thank you for being a gracious audience. I'm sweating and nervous up here. So uh, thank you for your patience. <laughs> All right. I will just introduce uh, briefly the Back to Land project. Um, I met uh, Brian Hill in uh, San Francisco in 2018. And uh, I had, uh, at the time, um, experience uh, with research about backland movement in Europe, uh, but I had not exactly a clue about uh, what happened here, uh, while uh, the backland movement in the US highly influenced the backland movement in Europe. And, uh, uh, well, uh, when we met uh, Brian and I, um, was, uh, in 2018, 2018. At, Judy's, 2018. Yeah, at Judy's uh, in San Francisco, at this dinner at the Planet Run Foundation, and uh, we realized that uh, there were a lot of common points between the Backland uh, movement in the U.S. and the Backland movement in Europe, but also strong divergences. And we also share um, a kind of sense of uh, urgency to preserve uh, the memory of the first um, generation back to landers uh, because we realized that uh, you know the natural cycles are what they are and so uh, we uh, we um, agreed to start um, this project um, together um, so I um, We'll just present the first part, and then uh, maybe Brian can share a little bit more uh, about the Backland project, but also about your experience. Uh, so we uh, founded uh, this project in 2018 uh, to collect a, data, a database of stories told uh, by the people who created and experienced the Backland movement since the 90s on the West Coast, and we call this effort a collective ethnography because uh, uh, we prefer uh, to have people co-participating and co-building the project with us uh, instead of just being uh, people uh, giving our science, and that's, uh, it's a way to erase uh, a lot of experience of people who can uh, talk uh, their stories in first person. And uh, it's a method that is probably uh, criticized at, in, in the academic world, uh, but that's what we both believe. So I'll um, let maybe uh, Brian up to um, tell a little bit more about the project, and maybe about your experience. Well, the Back to the Land project, it, it seemed to me that after going through the 60s and then watching in the 70s the, the countercultural energy of uh, opposing the state and being revolutionaries changed to people wanting to get back with nature. And I, I think it's a very important transition that I hope we get a chance to document and that gave me the idea of, that we should record while we're still alive, the generations that went through the 60s and then what happened, how they changed, how we changed from being countercultural people that were against the system and wanted to tear it down. What made us change to peaceful people who wanted to become one with nature? And I got so tired of hearing people saying the 60s died, the 60s was a waste of time. Well, it didn't. We went back into the woods and, and we became one with nature. And I thought it's, it's very important to record this and make a database. It seemed that the universities will want to know the history of how people changed from the 60s to the 70s. And then being an anthropologist, it, 
I, I saw it's very important that we, we trace the threads that when we went back into the woods, the threads that um, we brought from the 60s <coughs> and then changed our worldview. When, when cultures change from the old culture, that's, I call it the exploitative culture. And then the, in the 70s, the worldview became a reciprocal. When a culture changes its worldview so drastically, it's, it's not, it's a, a profound change. And um, I think we still haven't adjusted to it. The other thing I wanted to say was, there's a new movement it's called Off the Grid Movement. And if you go on the internet and look at, um, it's called Off the Grid and Homesteading Movement. And there's half a million people signed up and it's uh, from around the world. And it's like we started in the 60s, but it's not political, it's not religious, it's just people leaving the straight world and going back to nature. And they're starting from scratch like we didn't exist in the 60s. And I think it's really important in the 70s. And I think it's really important that we make an effort to hook up with the off the grid movement and help them find what we've already learned. And I'm hoping that, that with the database of our own experiences, first person experiences, and um, the, the off the grid, that, the, that will give energy <coughs> to pull our, what we started in the 60s back together, pull the threads from the 60s back together and it will blossom into the off the grid movement, which is um, coming now, I think, as the empire crumbles. I think that's all I have to say. I wanted to share um, with you a little bit of what I uh, learned in uh, like more than 15 years of uh, research about Bathland um, movement in, in Europe and especially in the French uh, Pyrenees. Um, so in Europe, the Bathland movement is, as in the United States, developing since the 60s. Um, the Commune, uh, as in the United States, are the first core of the back to land movement, although nuclear based families, so traditional family settlement, were uh, also important uh, since the beginning of the movement. There are different reasons to go back to land, uh, according to the literature and also my interviews, uh, ranging from recovering from political disappointment to spiritual purposes. Um, this movement uh, can also be considered a never-ending movement because there are waves of Bathland uh, until today. Uh, we are uh, today at the probably the, four, uh, the fourth generation of Bathlanders, and there is a coexistence between uh, traditional family settlements and communal way of lives. Uh, so. Mm, more communes, but also eco villages or uh, squat uh, in the countryside. And uh, France, of course, is a case study among others because the backland movement uh, has uh, spread um, across all the Europe. So, Spain, Italy, and United Kingdom are uh, three other uh, examples. Um, to come uh, to the background for f the French backland movement, as in the rest of the world, uh, there is the long history, of course, of the rural exodus and uh, of the utopias communally based. Um, so, um, in particular, in the 19th century uh, utopias. Um, of course, uh, the upheavals that happened in the 60s at various level levels. Um, including the uh, counterculture uh, of the 60s, first in the United States and then the spread globally. 
Uh, but there is probably something more particular because uh, in France, um, the measure of upheavals uh, were concentrated in two months, so May, June uh, 1968. Uh, these two months uh, were marked from, uh, by student arrest, uh, occupation, uh, barricade, and street demonstration. Uh, they were also two months uh, where we uh, had the biggest uh, general strike in the history of the country, with seven to ten million strikers concentrating in these two months. Uh, so, in this presentation, I will uh, start by a, a small atlas uh, of the Bachelain movement in France after 1968. Uh, then I will take a case of um, a county located in Pyrenees, uh, where I did a um, lot of field work and I also live. Uh, and then, new question emerging today. Uh, when we analyze the uh, back to land uh, movement. Uh, so to start with the uh, atlas, the back to land movement in France after May 1968, I will start by uh, this uh, book, the, the cover probably you, you, you will know uh, who uh, is representing. Uh, so it's called Hippie Adventure and it's kind of memoir of two journalists, but it's a, it's a book uh, for, for general public. And they start uh, by this sentence. Summer of 1968, the days after the failed May Revolution, leave a bitter taste like hangovers. Hundreds of young people leave the towns for the desert region of the south of France to find an abandoned home or village where living together and differently. So, first question is, where are these uh, backland movements spread uh, in France? Uh, mainly. So mainly in southern France, uh, especially in the counties the most touched by the rural exodus, some example, but also in the center and northeast, so generally on the two empty diagonals. Uh, you know, when you take a demographic card of uh, a demographic map of France, you see two diagonals where the population is uh, less um, uh, concentrated. And when you take this map, which is from um, Counterculture magazine in 71, uh, called CSC, you see that the location of the most important commune are exactly on these uh, two um, big diagonals. So uh, this uh, is uh, uh, mainly where they were located. And for the when and how many, uh, so the first rural communes were established one year um, before 1968, um, for example, an anarchist uh, intentional communities uh, of uh, Rochebes in Ardèche, or um, community by consensus objector uh, in Ariège County. But most of them were established after uh, May 1968, uh, according to two other journalists that brought a book called Looking for Happiness in 1972, uh, there were, at that time, in 1972, around 500 commu intentional communities with different styles, hosting more than 5,000 people in the winter and, be and between 30 to 40,000 in the summer. Um, there is also a mainstream idea that prevailed for years and years. It was the idea of a wave of arrivals uh, increasing uh, before uh, between 1968 and 72, and then decreasing quickly uh, after. Um, a sociologist mentioned, for example, that in 1975, 95% of these experiences failed. Um, well, except this data, it's impossible to know um, the exact number of back to landers in France uh, during mm, that time, except, of course, for uh, these resident in intentional communities. Um, however, if the proportion is uh, probably comparable uh, to uh, the one in the United States, in the United States in 1979, uh, for example, uh, a book mentioned uh, one million or more of people who went back to land. Um, so we can imagine that for France, 
the proportion is uh, similar. Um, so to, to come to the why they went back to land, for a long time uh, the sociologists insisted on uh, this hangover of May and also on uh, some uh, fear of occupied position lower than uh, the parents for explaining why a lot of people uh, went ba uh, back to land. Um, including so the deception of traditional politics, the fear of the middle upper classes student to get a lower social position once they graduate, and then uh, also uh, to withdraw temporarily by the system, uh, so by living in intentional communities, but also by a series of other means related uh, more or less uh, to the country culture, for example, the free press, the drug use, the trade to India, uh, etc. In this vision, um, the economic or practical problem of the, communi of the communal lifestyle and the conflict with local population trigger a failure of uh, these experiences by 1975. Um, so a majority of individuals uh, returning to the town and reintegrate the system without any social demotion, so without occupying a lower uh, social position than their parents. And those, uh, those we decided to stay in the countryside uh, in a more traditional family frame became a sort of uh, new rural bourgeoisie because they uh, got, in this vision, rents from the state and they integrated uh, highly with the local people, especially becoming electing in town halls or um, taking local responsibilities in association. So the idea uh, that emerged at this time is that uh, we shift from marginal people to kind of marginal gentrifiers or rural gentrifiers and also from utop utopic migration to amenity migration so to experience the uh, uh, beauty of the landscape uh, and uh, things like this to have a, 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 a good existence uh, without any other utopic purposes and uh, the administration uh, curiously uh, they also uh, change uh, the designation be because before they were designated like hippies or marginal or commoners and now mm, they are designated by a specific uh, term, especially for giving grants, which is the term of new rural, so the new rural de dwellers. Um, two sociologists, for example, in a book uh, called um, at the end of the forest, there is always a state. Um, tell that uh, in this time, their utopia changed. These families of back to landers are now looking for a green, healthy, and authentic lifestyle. Since uh, the 2000, uh, studies emphasize main limit uh, of this uh, uh, focus. Uh, first limit is that uh, these studies on the back land movement focus on a single generation led by middle upper class students uh, and one of my colleagues for example in her uh, PhD dissertation uh, showed the existence of micro units of generation uh, with different social origin and destinies and then I can uh, personally confirm because uh, a lot of people I interviewed uh, in the Pyrenees including from the generation of the 60s uh, are people uh, with a poor um, working uh, class uh, background. So it's uh, probably true that some sociologists at the end of the 70s focus on middle upper classes, but it's maybe also related because they knew these middle upper classes people and they had access uh, to their lifestyle. Um, the second limit is the focus on this true reason to going back to land, so having uh, the fear of a social demotion and uh, having the hangovers of uh, the fire revolution. While um, a lot of interviews I made uh, show a great variety of motivation, at 
it sh they show also that there are people who are mm, going who went back to land for more political reason but also people that have spiritual purposes and have a whole range uh, of reason that were not really mentioned in these studies um, of the 70s 80s uh, and then they focus of course on a single wave of arrivals uh, while um, we show on different um, um, work that there were uh, several waves of arrivals and today three generation at least uh, of back to landers. Um, so before I started my, my field work in the Pyrenees, um, I was asking myself, first, is it true that uh, all the rural community-based experience are intended to fail? Um, second, are we sure that a great majority of the backlanders that remained in the countryside reconverted and became a kind of new rural bourgeoisie? Uh, third, uh, do we really witness an improvement of the relationship with locals since the 70s? And finally, what about their children and grandchildren, so the second and the third generation? Um, to try to respond very quickly to this question, I um, want to focus now on the case of uh, this county. Um, and uh, this county, so first is located, as you can see, at the Spanish border. Uh, between 1967, because uh, the first intentional community established there, it was one year before 1968 and 1973, uh, we witnessed indeed a wave of arrival more related to communes, uh, for example, Le Courtal, uh, Le Bosque, Villeneuve du Bosque, Sarah du Scla, and they were located near uh, Foix, uh, which is uh, the eastern part of the county. Um, after 73, and especially between 75 and 77, there, there was a second wave located this time in uh, the Couserin region, which is more western part um, of the um, county. And um, uh, this wave was composed uh, from individual and communal projects. Uh, example, this is a commune, uh, an intentional community, that was uh, established in 1984 in a small village of uh, Arut, and they host uh, at the same time uh, people from uh, children uh, from poor families coming uh, from the cities, uh, but also they uh, do vegetables and fruit and uh, um, they have a booth on the local market and they establish, uh, even contributed to establish a local market in a small village. Uh, this second example is a eco village, so uh, Milpat Castle because it's a uh, established on the ruin of a Qatar castle, and it was established in 1992, and uh, at the origin it was for a festival uh, called Ecotopia, so Ecotopia sounds maybe familiar uh, to uh, many uh, of uh, you, but um, uh, it stands since and is composed of a cabin and yurt and other places, and people uh, her uh, gods, and they try uh, just to have a vegetable uh, garden and being uh, as uh, many of the grid as possible uh, by producing their solar energy and uh, uh, their system of water and they are totally off the grid. Uh, another example is an anarchy squat uh, of Le Palmier, uh, which has been eventually exposed by, by the police uh, in 2017, but it's another example of people uh, who um, took over a um, um, former mill, wood mill, and they turned into, into a, a squad with um, concert and political activities and other things. And also, uh, there are individual settlements. Uh, more or less uh, communal oriented, 
established since the 60s. Uh, for example, um, this is a picture of a, a person who is now retired uh, who um, produced some cheese. Another uh, person uh, who um, tried to um, herb um, cows and he has also uh, woofers in order to help him but also to um, uh, to transmit his knowledge uh, to these people uh, this is my um, dear friend Eve uh, who is living in, in a cabin and uh, having uh, goats and sheep and uh, being uh, most independent as possible and well so this is some example of uh, of uh, people and experiences you can um, you can find in Paris so the choice of this remote location because uh, you've seen uh, the county is uh, really at the border and they are in uh, especially located backlanders in the uh, mountainside and hillside uh, of the county uh, so it can be explained by many factors first uh, a sentence who might be uh, popular here at the uh, uh, any, anyway, I found uh, in in book about communist California. So, is bad roads make good communes? So, uh, it's something that uh, uh, it was apparently uh, some popular sentence, but lead also to a viable cheap or free lands. Um, in this county, indeed, there were a lot of abandoned land after the rural exodus uh, with ruin of barns and they were cheap to buy or, or free to squat. And so this barn, they, were, um, they have been uh, turning living buildings. Uh, I have two examples of, uh, of a barn reconverted in living building. Um, to uh, come now on the composition of the group, um, the source of income and the state of relationship with locals, which were uh, probably the other uh, questions. Uh, so the backlanders established in the Pyrenees, um, and there especially, they are not only from France, but from all over Europe, uh, and mainly um, the northern countries are uh, represented very well, uh, so Germany, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, and uh, United Kingdom, and sometimes you find also uh, individuals uh, from other places in the world, uh, US, India, Australia, and uh, this is part of this counterculture hub because uh, uh, a lot of these people, um, especially in the first generation, they met on the road uh, to Ipitre to India and they uh, returned uh, together uh, to the land in, um, in, in the Pyrenees. But I have also a lot of other stories of uh, especially uh, children of um, 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 army members established in Berlin, uh, Western Berlin after the war they um, they also uh, reunited together and they took acid together and they went back to land uh, together uh, in the Pyrenees. Um, so now to um, go to the main incomes uh, on um, on Ariège County, uh, the agriculture of course, um, the art and craft, uh, but also the ecotourism, uh, the construction uh, sector. Maybe the difference with the United States is um, that there is less cannabis produced uh, because it's uh, still highly repressed, uh, repressed. And also, um, the welfare policies are uh, more important. So, uh, you have, uh, for example, a minimum uh, living allowance, uh, allowing to at least cover uh, some expenses and the employment, of course. And indeed, there are um, state and European Union grants that are allowed, especially for the agriculture, the common uh, agriculture policy, which can allow um, to uh, stay in this country. Um, as I told before, there are different social background, motivation, and uh, relationship with locals. 
because not all uh, of the backlanders, including from the first generation, became uh, rural gentrifiers, and not all have been reconverted in politics, taken a responsibility in association, or turned in uh, uh, a very um, traditional uh, way of, uh, of life. Um, there are many waves of uh, arrivals, and they are defined in various ways since the uh, since the 80s. Uh, for example, some um, mentioned the fact that these uh, waves uh, are uh, related to um, musical, um, uh, for example, uh, styles, or uh, other from, for example, political reasons, like uh, uh, no, no global. And now we will be at the wave of the collapse uh, theory and remote workers, so people who are afraid of the consequences of uh, uh, climate change, but also remote workers, just people who will be there uh, to do their job um, just at distance. And we can observe um, kind of improvement of relationship uh, with, the, uh, with locals due to the um, second and third generation marriages or couple, but it's not uh, uniform, uh, the situation is not uniform, so there are also uh, still a lot of uh, conflict. So, just to summarize, we can uh, first observe an extreme uh, diversity of profiles, and in general, uh, backlanders have contributed to revitalize the county population and reverse the rural exodus. For example, in this graphic, you can see that since the 1960s, uh, there is an improvement of population in the county. Uh, but it doesn't mean that all of them have gentrified the county or have abandoned their uh, original county culture aspirations. Um, so today, just to conclude, there are many questions emerging about the backland movement in France, but there are three main questions probably. First, are we witnessing a new wave or a new backland movement in this context of contemporary overlapping economy, economic, environmental and political crisis? Second, question is what does the impact of new technologies, especially internet and the remote world? And the third question, why during the pandemic uh, an increasing number of individuals have chosen to go back to that? And of course also the question of can we compare the US and uh, the French situation? So. Um, just for giving first um, responses to this uh, question emerging today, um, the remote work and the arrival of retired people in, uh, uh, in the countryside especially can comfort the idea of a rural gentrification today. But at the same time, there are other individual and group uh, showing different reasons. For example, uh, the people coming into this uh, new collapse movement uh, believe in France, which is very uh, strong. But also the ZAD, the ZAD are uh, the defense zone, so the um, the opposition to um, big building projects, for example, airport or highways, and people uh, start to. Uh, settle in the place where the project is intended to be uh, built and then they, uh, they build cabin and they uh, start to grow vegetables and it's, uh, it's a new kind of back land but uh, today it's, uh, it's very uh, important in France at the point that the uh, Department of State has created a special section to fight uh, this uh, ZAD, this project of uh, occupation of land. Um, another response uh, is uh, uh, one of my colleagues and I, we are agreeing on this point, is that the reality uh, seems to become or being rediscovered uh, as a new utopian horizon, while for uh, many years uh, it was uh, the utopian horizon and uh, the idea of opening was more associated with cities. And also, there is a multiplication of interest uh, for the countryside and the back to land by different actors, so sociologists. For example, when I started my uh, fieldwork in 2008, at my knowledge, we were 
three or four to work uh, on this topic in, in France and uh, we were considered like uh, uh, the joint smokers of uh, sociologists because we were so on the topic so abstract and so and then today there are uh, many PhD seminars and whatever, so we, we really witness a new interest, but also by journalists, politicians, uh, and uh, the private sector. The private sector today uh, is taking um, this new movement of being back to land uh, as, um, as something uh, for making some money. Um, for example, there is a, probably another backland movement and another narrative about the backland movement which is emerging today. It's a narrative uh, of um, a backland movement uh, which will be depoliticized, so no topic aspiration, and comfortable with the neoliberal greenwashing and agenda. So. Uh, the impression is that uh, if you go back to land today in this um, kind of uh, interpretation, it's just because you want to reach a um, wellness at the individual point and you are um, probably, uh, you feel that you act for the planet because you just uh, uh, do, for example, um, you support uh, local farmers, and uh, but you still uh, can remote work, uh, work remotely, and uh, uh, you can still continue to live uh, the, um, your your life. And for example, uh, the um, in 2022 last year, uh, a Congress uh, united a um, series of factors convinced that uh, uh, we are witnessing a new. Uh, back to land movement, but this new back to land movement is not very utopic. If you can see, for example, from this graphic, um, one of the main sponsors of this Congress was the nuclear uh, power companies um, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, state um, partners and also um, big association. And they are um, trying to uh, think another. Um, back to land, it's back to land, but also territories. Uh, so uh, with different interpretation uh, compared to the original uh, movement. So just to conclude um, the comparison for the point of the comparison, uh, at my sense it's necessary to understand the past, the present and the future of the back to land movement, but also the circulation between uh, the Europe and the US. And just uh, uh, to conclude uh, this question of urgency, uh, the urgency today is to preserve the memories and the legacy of the first generation of backlanders. And this is what we are trying to do uh, with the Country Culture History Coalition and the Backland Project. And well, thank you for your attention. from Junction City to the coast. The town consists of a store, a post office, and about 10 houses. Much of the community lives up a nearby country road, which passes through deep fields and dappled tree shadows, bowered by big leaf maple, alder, and Douglas fir. Here and there, visitors glimpse trailers or houses through the veil of leaves. I grew up at the far end of the valley in one of the last houses before the gravel road winds up into the mountains. With the help of motley friends, my parents built our home in 1976. For a bunch of hippies with minimal construction experience, they managed amazingly well. Wood was cheaper in those days and the house has good beams, solid and true. The roof is shingled in front and tin in back an arrangement that amplifies the drum of rain. Trees tower above, maple, alder, chestnut, and a fir that rises a good eight stories. Through the windows, the world is a mass of trembling green. Beneath the canopy, huckleberry and vine maples, maple leaves filter the light, and pre-maple suck sword ferns grow from a carpet of shamrock, sorrel, and helium. The saga of how this house came to exist is straight hit me, a condition defined by either kismet or foolishness. 
as the story goes, my dad was hanging out in a bar in Juneau, Alaska in the late 1960s when he met a man named David Dean. They bonded over their love of drinking and classic country music. <laughs> Instant friends, they went on to host a country radio show called The Wildwood Flower Hour. Eventually, they both left Juno for new adventures, but stayed in touch. In 1972, David wrote Steve, urging him to come on down to Oregon to a place called Five Rivers. At the time, Steve was living in a shack on a Washington slough and coming to terms with a crumbling relationship. He headed south in his green 65 Dodge van. Five Rivers turned out to be a dissolute collection of shacks and mossy farmhouses strung out along a river. Following David's vague directions, Steve located a swinging bridge two planks two wide. On the other side stood a cedar-shaped cabin shaded by big firs. Clinging to the cable rail, Steve crossed over the creek and arrived, panting, on the front porch. His knock was answered by a handsome blonde hippie kid, maybe 19 or 20, stark naked and looking alarmed. <laughs> Steve asked if David was around. David's not here right now, man. Suddenly noting his own nudity, the kid explained, Eileen, man, she's just had a baby. I wanted to be naked to, you know, feel solidarity with the baby, to understand what it feels like to come new into the world. <laughs> As it turned out, the group also had more practical concerns. They needed to get Eileen to the hospital. Steve obliged with his van and his bearish ability to make everything seem okay. In keeping with his other defining characteristic, garrulous charm, he became fast friends with the kid, Morgan Davy, the woman, Eileen, her husband, Irv, and their baby daughter, Lisa. With his usual good fortune, he found a new family at the exact moment that his old life dissolved. They'd scraped together the cash to buy a chunk of land just over the mountain from Five Rivers and invited my dad to build a cabin. Steve asked his new girlfriend, Tina, to join him for the summer. The cabin, built almost for a lark, would become our beloved family home, inconveniently located on someone else's property. <laughs> My dad and his friends weren't alone. Deadwood was a magnet for the back to the land movement that began in the mid 60s. To urban and suburban kids raised in the era of TV dinners and lawns as perfect as the social norms were rigid, living wild on the land was the ultimate romantic rebellion. Moving to rural Oregon was a fuck you to every parent who lobbied for a sensible career path and every college dean who ever sniffed at radical idealism. Deadwood was rebellion, but it was also retreat. The Green Valley with its sheltering mountains was a haven from everything the hippies were rebelling against. After a decade of chaotic uproar, going back to the land represented a different form of protest. The deceptive softness of moss and leaf gave the illusion of shelter from the vagaries of a tumultuous era. In the birdsong light of rural dawn, institutionalized racism in the Vietnam War could be viewed safely in the abstract. But without the sense of selling out, because hey, dropping out was a form of positive protest. Instead of changing the institutions of mainstream society, the hippies were forming an alternative society. The young rebels didn't exactly come to Deadwood in droves, droves, but the old pioneer community did experience a dramatic influx. The original logging families looked askance at the newcomers, braless women in peasant blouses and overalls, bearded men who didn't know how to swing an ax. Undeterred by local disapproval, the tenderfoots brought trailers and yurts, built drafty shacks, planted weed, and had babies. Although my parents agreed with the back to the land ethos and my mom could be seen hoeing her garden beds in her overalls, they were nomadic and more flamboyant than the average Deadwoodian. They didn't fit any particular mold, but were true hippies in the sense that their eccentricities seemed to well from within. Genuine manifestations of what they love without much thought as how it might be perceived by the outside world. 
In Steve's case, this translated to Hawaiian shirts, classic country music, bird watching, and rattle trap bands with bumper stickers that said stuff like, no bozos, and I inhaled. <laughs> In Tina's case, it translated to playing the recorder, practicing witchcraft, and wearing fake fur magenta coats. When it came to rural life skills, they had a head start on some of our younger hippie neighbors. My dad was 38 when he moved to Deadwood. He'd already survived years working as a marine biologist on the Bering Sea, incarceration in a Mexican jail, and hundreds of roadside breakdowns. With his black beard and growing gut, he looked a little like Jerry Garcia and had once been mistaken for Allen Ginsberg at a Bay Area party. He'd successfully masqueraded as the poet for the rest of the night. He was a decent grease monkey, knew how to split wood, and was able to get along with just about anybody, except my mother. <laughs> Born in 1944 to two San Francisco opera singers, my mom had adopted the hippie ethos at an early age when she hitchhiked to Mexico after graduating from Stanford. By the time she moved to Deadwood, she lived on communes in Idaho and California, where she learned an arsenal of necessary hippie skills, including spinning, gardening, canning, splitting firewood, and chanting the various names of the goddess. My parents shared a common sensibility and a few common interests booze, books, and parrots. They were deeply devoted to their mutual goals, getting to Mexico, finding good deals, and subverting the petty tyranny of the mainstream. As parents, they were absolutely, unif absolutely unified in their roles and objectives. Other than that, they were very different. Steve was a scientist, Tina a serious student of the Tarot. He surrounded himself with people. She valued solitude. He was typically easygoing and disliked conflict. She was darkly volatile and guarded her interests with the tenacity of a Maury eel. <laughs> Their differences extended to cultural alignment. Tina was classical, Steve was honky tonk. I was born in December of 1978. Tina had wanted a home birth, but my enormous head prevented that. And after 30 hours of labor, Steve drove her an hour and a half to Sacred Heart Hospital in Eugene. My parents named me Felisa Chirpa Rosa Rogers, but called me Chirpa. I always planned on calling you Chirpa, Tina would later explain. We just added the Felisa in case you ever needed to sound respectful. <laughs> Two years later, Tina got pregnant again, but miscarried. She was 37. I remained an only child, watching the back and forth between two strong and wildly different personalities. Our house gathered visitors, drawn to my dad's cooking and pension for stories, or perhaps by the boxed wine that flowed freely. Steve presided over the kitchen with equal measures of irritability and glee. It was a narrow space, separated from the dining room by a redwood counter, and Steve guarded the domain and viewed any intrusion with mounting irritation. He rarely accepted help, except with the most mundane and onerous tasks, peeling garlic and grating cheese. The kitchen was his kingdom and we were his serfs. He'd always had a taste for the exotic. His mother, Mackie, was an unambitious cook. And he'd grown up in the culinary doldrums of Ohio in the 1940s. Bored with baked chicken and limp vegetables, he'd started cooking as a kid. He reveled in curries, African round nut stew, chile rellenos, and pungent stir fries. He ate squid long before calamari was a menu item, and he lived for Asian grocery stores, which were still rarities in the U.S. in those days. Despite our shoestring budget, he delighted in making huge meals for friends, acquaintances, and complete strangers. Although the kitchen was its beating heart, the house also had a generous front porch, a wood stove, and a Steinway grand piano, a family heirloom on my mother's side. The walls were crowded with paintings, Mexican masks, and overflowing bookshelves. In the summer, Tina painted tin cans to create pots for marigolds and petunias. These lined our rickety front stairs, and the veranda was decorated with elk antlers and fair flags. Like many rural Oregonians, my parents grew weed to support their craft business. Steve forged heavy silver rings around Mexican jade and opal and Tina wove woolly ponchos decorated with limpet shells from the beaches of Jalisco and Nayarit. In the summers, they worked craft shows and trudged through the 
dense undergrowth to their cannabis patch, which was hemmed by a forest far from our house. By the time I was walking, I was part of a tribe of semi-feral local children. We weren't all neighbors in the town sense of the word, but we had great freedom to roam. The yards along our one-lane road were littered with bikes, and our parents thought nothing of letting us go on unchaperoned rides. Older kids were expected to look after their younger siblings, which facilitated the development of a large pack of kids that ranged in age from 4 to 14. A good half of Upper Deadwood was Jewish. A Jewish community is unexpected in rural Oregon, but I suppose it developed in the usual way, people inviting their friends to come check it out. Or maybe a disproportionate number of 70s radicals and back to the landers were Jewish. Whatever the case, I grew up singing along with Shabbos prayers at potlucks and attending interminable seders. <laughs> The local culture was also shaped by a typical hippie reverence for all things Native American. Only a few Native people lived in Deadwood, but the community as a whole was prone to smudging sweat lodges and praying to the Great Spirit. Nowadays, cultural appropriation is a sensitive and complicated topic, and it's easy to make fun of white hippies for adopting Native traditions. But despite the inherent problems and questions of appropriation, the attraction is not surprising. A desire for tradition and meaning is at the heart of hippie culture. The back of the landers were rebelling against what they saw as the empty and destructive tenets of mainstream culture. But even as they rebelled against the old guard, they were instinctually returning to something even older. In a sense, our parents built an old fashioned community in Deadwood. People grew and canned their own food sewed their own clothing, quilted, spun wool, wove, split their own wood, raised livestock, and attended to neighbors in need, even the ones they disliked. Our reverence for Native American tradition was another return to that most ancient of human tendencies, ceremony. As a kid, I never questioned the disappropriation of other cultures. I prayed to the Great Spirit at night. I imagined a giant pot with mystical powers, and I willfully tried to sustain my belief in fairies. I memorized the significance of my mother's tarot cards and collected healing crystals. But at the same time, I was envious of people whose worldview was shaped by a defining tradition. I loved the pomp and ornate glory of Catholicism. I daydreamed of taking First Communion or having a bat mitzvah. In addition to sweat lodges and Jewish holy days, we grew up at jam sessions and potlucks, where the adults would drink gallons of Carlo Rossi and try to convince us we should eat tabbouleh, lentil salads, and rank goat cheese. We would hide in the tall grass and run wild in the dusk as our parents got high and talked about expanding consciousness and the vagaries of rural life, outhouses and pack rats in green firewood. <laughs> There is some irony to the trajectory of the Back of the Land movement, originally inspired by an idealistic vision of a natural rural utopia. These urban and suburban kids became entrenched in the practical details of living in the middle of nowhere. Rickety houses and jerry-rigged water systems, mountains of wood to be hauled and split, gardens to be hoed and weeded, and the eternal beating back of the underbrush dimbleberry, salmonberry, and blackberry that could stifle a house within weeks left unattended. A century before, the short growing season and dense isolation of the Oregon Coast Range had quickly tempered the dreams of the original pioneers. The electrifying westward expansion of the 19th century had ended here in the damp valleys and steep hills that abutted the Pacific Ocean. Deceptively green meadows had promised agricultural riches, but the coastal soil and short growing season whittled dreams. The people who stayed became gnarled and pragmatic, hunkered down to the rain, the fog, the daily grind. The back of the landers would also fall prey to the reality of the coast range, which catches all the storms that blow in off the Pacific. Western Lane County is one of the rainiest regions in the entire country, and the promised hippie Eden of green summers and lazy rivers gave way to dreary fogs and suffocating cloud banks. 
Coast Range winters are not hard by Midwestern standards, but they are long and wet and grim. Roofs leak and pipes burst. Wood stoves must be constantly stoked to stave off a hollow dampness that settles into the bones. Back to the landers who had once been ignited with dreamy idealism now found themselves driven by practical calls. Food on the table, wood on the fire, meat in the drying room. With the optimism of youth, our parents had experimented with communal living and then semi-communal living. They tried using clear plastic as siding and discovered that all that light didn't quite compensate for moist sauna-like conditions. They built houses out of hay bales and converted old school buses into trailers. They ignored county regulations and dotted their properties with unpermitted structures. As the years went by, they learned from their mistakes. The dreary weather and grinding inconvenience of rural living took its toll. People quit growing weed and got real jobs in town. They saved money and moved out of their trailers and shacks, built bigger, more practical houses. They graveled their driveways and weatherized their windows and achieved a modicum of respectability. They grew house proud, garden proud. They were still living the dream, but it wasn't the dream they dreamed as idealistic kids in the 1970s. They'd settled into the nurturing yet limiting reality of life in a tiny, tight-knit community. My family never achieved this modicum of stability and respectability. <laughs> <laughs>